listen to the words of the song. Maybe they'll touch your heart in a new way. Let this be a time of praise and time to honor God for what he's already done in your life and a time to welcome his further work in your life. Hannah prayed, my heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn, my strength and courage is lifted up by the Lord. My mouth boasts over my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. And there is no rock like our God. Let's worship him like Hannah. Let's lift our voices in worship and bring honor and glory to his name. Amen.
forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again My King would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? joy to honor you in all I do I honor you I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well in me because you died and rose again amazing love how can it be that you my king would die for me amazing love I know it's true it's my joy to honor you
coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break, as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. And every knee will bow before him. And who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 And 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 who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion. The Lion of Judah, he's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow before him. Join me as we pray this morning. Heavenly Father, how good it is again to be here today and your presence with people of Avon Community Church, how we need you. We don't come today as people who have it all together and as people who don't struggle with sin and as people who don't have some very real needs and challenges in our life. Lord, we are your people, and you are our Heavenly Father, and because of that, our problems become your problems, our needs become your needs, our challenges become your challenges, and what a privilege, Lord, it is that you give us to bring all that to you today. So in our worship, as we worship your great name, as we recognize your holiness, your distinctness, you are the unique God, the only real true God. Stand against all the other idols, the false gods, the false religions that are out there, the man-created gods that people worship. You are the one true God, Lord God Almighty. We worship you today, how we need you, how we need to hear from you through your word today, how we need the Holy Spirit's power and presence to help us to live this 
life that you call us to live, which is impossible without your help, your power, your provision. So we come today resting in that. Lord, we've left another busy week where just about everyone in here is just way too busy for their own good. All that's on the plates of the people here, Lord, it it becomes overwhelming at times and a great challenge at times. And so it's good to come into your presence and know that this is the place we can rest. We can rest in your grace. We can rest in being assured of your work for us that you've done the work and that you sat down at the right hand of God because the work is finished. We no longer have to try and work up your favor, work to earn your salvation, but we come on this day we call a day of rest to rest in your grace, to hear from you again the gospel message, that you are for us, that you are with us, that you can help us with any need we have. What, What a joy that is. So I pray today, Heavenly Father, that these dear people would find their satisfaction in you, would find their joy in you, would find their pleasure in you and a relationship with you and whatever's going on in the world, Lord, that that wouldn't rattle them because their greatest satisfaction, their greatest purpose is found in knowing that you are in charge, that you have a plan and that our future in you is great and because of that we can rest in worship. We can cease striving. We can allow you to quiet our soul. We can allow you to do your work of transformation in our heart, in our mind, in a way that surprises even us, because you are doing the work. And so we thank you for this rest today that we enjoy. What a privilege that you call us to set aside one day in seven to to rest from our labor to rest in our salvation, to enjoy one another and to minister your grace to one another, to set aside our selfish desires and plans and take that one day in seven and make it your day and find our rest and worship in you. Lord, what a privilege. Thank you for that today. Lord, we thank you for this offering we're about to take as our ushers come forward this morning. And we pray your blessing on this offering. We pray that you would use it to continue the work of gospel proclamation in our city and around the world. Lord, thank you for the generosity of these dear people who love you, who want to see the gospel proclaimed both locally and globally. Continue to bless them. Continue to help us to be generous in all that you've given to us of time and talent and treasure, that all of it would be used for your glory and the good of others, we pray in your strong name, Jesus. Amen. All right, all of our kids can go to Children's Church. 
Find your leaders back in the back. All the kids can be dismissed to Children's Church. Grab your Bible and turn to Matthew's Gospel. Continuing our way through Matthew chapter 6. Happened to be on the Lord's Prayer today, and it's been interesting just to see the songs and how they relate to what we're going to talk about today. We're really looking at only one part of one verse. I'm going to read the whole prayer to you again today, but we're we're focused today on just this phrase, hallowed be your name. So in praying the Lord's Prayer, I don't know if you've ever given much thought to that. What in the world does that mean, hallowed be your name? But because this is the prayer Jesus gave the disciples and us to pray, every single word of this prayer is important. And I hope today after we're finished that you'll have a new understanding and appreciation for this phrase, hallowed be your name. So let's start at verse 9 and uh, we'll come back to just that part of it, but let's read the whole prayer again. Maybe you want to read it with me. If you have an NIV, I know some of you learned this in the King James. I heard Pastor Lee pray last week and you know, if you've learned it that way and catechism and the King James language of thy and thou and all that, that's fine. But if you look at your Bible on page 1380, if you have a pew Bible or an NIV uh, translation, uh, let's just say the prayer together as we start. And in the NIV, you'll notice at the very bottom, that last phrase is in a footnote at the bottom. And I just remind you again that that was added by the church fathers later on because they thought it needed a good benediction. And so it's actually a quote from a couple of different psalms. So uh, it is biblical, but don't let that throw you. Uh, Every time I make that kind of a comment, people find me and they're confused about it. But uh, I didn't make up the rules. The church fathers, you know, decided a long time ago that that the prayer should end that way. So find in your Bible. If you say it a little different way than us, that's fine. But we're going to read together. Most of us from uh, Matthew chapter 6 in the NIV Page 1380 in your pew Bible. Are you ready? Our Father. You're doing it. I'm letting you do it. Let's start over. Let's do take two. Ideas to read it out loud, preferably. I shut up sometimes so you can hear each other. Okay, you ready? Our Father in heaven. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we're going to focus in particular just on this phrase, if you'll look at it, hallowed be your name. You know, this is the month of October, and unfortunately, we've forgotten church history. And uh, believe it or not, October the 31st hasn't always been Halloween. Are you aware of that? It's a modern uh, holiday And uh, October the 31st, actually, why is it called Halloween? Because that very word hollow is talking about honoring the saints of the past. So if you grew up in the Catholic Church or a Lutheran or an Anglican Church, they had their church history right, and usually the first Sunday in November, or November 1st, they would call All Saints Day. And the church would remember the saints of the past. And even in a lot of evangelical churches, sometimes on November 1st, they will read out loud the names of the church members who've died in the previous year as just simply a way to honor them and to speak of their faithfulness. And so we have been so Americanized by focusing so much on a made-up holiday, Halloween, that we've forgotten what's the original point of celebrating this, which was October the 31st when Martin Luther did what he did and started the Reformation and uh, that, that became, for the Protestant church, a day of celebrating what the Reformers did and remembering uh, that great Reformation that, that took place. So this name, Hallowed, is important. Hallowed be your name. Why would Jesus, at the very beginning of the prayer, it's a very simple prayer. You can say this prayer out loud in about 20 seconds. I did it in my office this morning. I, I timed it yet once again. I knew that was true. But you can say this prayer in about 20 seconds. It's not a long prayer. But every single word of this prayer matters. Why would Jesus start this prayer with those four words, Our Father in heaven? 
And he wanted us to begin by realizing that this is not a solo act. We're part of a community. We're part of a family. It's not you and Jesus in your Bible. It's not you and Jesus in your favorite podcast. It's not you and Jesus in your favorite TV preacher. Our Father means we have been called into a family, and we don't make the rules. He makes the rules. He's the head of the house, and he tells us how we worship him and even how we pray. And he starts out not... Your father, my father, but our father, so that we would remember we're part of a family. Church is a, is a group of families. It's not a group of individuals who are very independent and do what they want to do. We are a family. If your family acted like some of you treat the church, it'd be in bad shape. Our father in heaven. Jesus wanted us to pray and realize we are now part of a new heavenly fa- a family, and we have a heavenly father. We're not orphans. And we shouldn't act like orphans, always afraid of whatever's going wrong in the world. Something happens and we're, we just get rattled by every little thing. He wants us to know we have a heavenly father who's powerful. He created the world. And then he says, hallowed be your name. Jesus was very concerned that the father's name would be honored. That's what this word hallowed means. It's to give reference to. It's to have great respect. We, we sang it this morning, to honor God. That's what Jesus is saying here. How do we honor God? You honor God by every aspect of your life. If you were listening when we were singing, it talked about that. We, we want to honor God in the way that we live. And everything that you do can either honor God's name or can bring shame to God's name. You need to understand the Lord's Prayer is not just a prayer we're to pray, and it is, but the Lord's Prayer gives us the way of life as a Christian. This is how we live our life. Our life is lived not selfishly, not doing what we want to do, but our life is lived with an attempt to bring glory to the name of God in every setting where God places us. Hallowed be your name. I just want you to know it, it is an outline. It, it's good. I, I've given you this prayer guide that I've used since I was a college student. I've tweaked it over the years, and you can tweak it more. This isn't Bible, but it contains the Lord's Prayer. But I've used this since I was a, a college student just to kind of make sure that my prayer was balanced. And, and it is an outline. The Lord's Prayer is a way of Jesus honoring the disciples' requests because they saw him pray, and they said, we ought to pray. Would you teach us to pray? And this prayer was a response to their question, and it's to be passed on to us like we're doing today. So it is an outline. It is good just to pray the prayer by itself. Some of you came out of a more liturgical background, and it was such a part of your church experience that it became more of a ritual for you and the overreaction to that is that you tend to say well I don't want to pray the prayer just to pray it because I used to do that before and it was really a ritual with no meaning and it can be that but it doesn't have to be the early church was taught and discipled to pray the Lord's prayer at least three times a day because even praying it kind of corrects your thinking, even praying it when you don't stop and linger like this outline helps you to do in your prayer time. Even just praying the prayer is going to refocus your mind on what really matters and what's really important in the world. So it is an outline. It is good just to pray it. But what I want you to learn from today and take from today, it's maybe something you haven't thought about as much with the prayer. It is the pattern for your life. It's the way that you are to live your life. Your life is to be about his glory, not your own glory. If you want to find out what happens when you seek just your glory, your selfish desires, your wants, your impulses, read the book of Ecclesiastes. We were talking about it this morning in our elder prayer time. Someone read the book of Ecclesiastes out while they were bow hunting, and they were like, oh my gosh, this is so depressing. And I said, yeah, the reason it's depressing is because Solomon, who had access to everything, he could do anything he wanted, he could get away with anything he wanted, he was king, and let me just say, being the king is a good gig if you can get it. There's not many job openings, but if you get it, it's a good gig. And Solomon had that. He had access. He could do whatever he wanted. He had all the wealth. No one could stop him other than God. He could do whatever he wanted, and he did that for a period of time. The young Solomon was very godly. Young people, remember that. 
When he was a young man, he had a really godly heart. He really wanted to please God and bring him glory. But he got older and he kind of backslid. He kind of became influenced by the culture and, and all the wives that he took in and their idols and their way of life. And he, and he kind of got away from God. And then the old Solomon comes back and writes the book of Ecclesiastes and says, this is the life of folly. If you want to know what folly is, Folly and foolishness is to think that the greatest thing in life is just for you to pursue pleasure on your terms, you just to go on your impulses, you do what you think is going to make you happy. And Solomon, who's someone who's not theoretically speaking from the ivory tower, but a man who actually did that, he started out good as a young person, loving God, wanting to follow God, a, a really good young man, and then he backslides and gets away from God and does what he wants to do, and finally as an old man he writes the book of Ecclesiastes. And he says, it's all meaningless. All this money that you're chasing, if it's not intended to be used to glorify God and to build up his kingdom, I'm going to tell you it's meaningless. There will be a day when you realize that. The most important thing to you is more, 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 bigger, bigger, bigger. You're going to get there at some point, more than likely, and you're going to say, why am I not happy? Why am I still not satisfied? Why do I still not have joy? Why is my soul still not at peace? It's because you're not listening to God's word. He put a whole book in the Bible to say, don't do this. Don't do this. And the Lord's Prayer is for us a very succinct thing that reminds us this is how I am supposed to live. I begin my day, I, I begin my month, I begin my year by focusing on my Father in heaven and realizing I'm not an orphan. He loves me, he cares for me, I don't have to worry. His promise is to provide for me, to protect me, to meet my needs. And then I pray, I want to honor this God. If this is a God whose promises to me is, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to give you purpose. You're going to have a great future. Then I want to bring honor to him. Why wouldn't I? It's the least I can do to show gratitude. I, I want to honor his name. So I just want you to remember this week as you think about the Lord's Prayer, I hope you will, that the Lord's Prayer is really the way you ought to live your life. So pray it this week. Pray it three times. Pick three hours during the day and just pray the Lord's Prayer. And let it remind you, this is how I am supposed to live. Get out of yourself. It's the hardest challenge. Get out of yourself, your selfish way of thinking. You're, you're going by your impulses. You're doing what you've always done. And let this Lord's Prayer shape your mind. Get into your soul. I'm telling you, it will change your life. Why wouldn't it? Jesus wrote it. Change your life. It, it's a way to live. When we pray our Father in heaven, what are we saying? Someone said, hey, you pray this prayer, our Father in heaven. I, I don't really get it. What, what are you saying when, when you say that? How would you answer them? What you're saying when you say our Father in heaven is you're saying God is in control. That's the phrase, in heaven. He is ruling in heaven. Sovereign has to do with governance. He is the ruler of the universe. He is the creator, the sustainer of all of it. He's sovereign. When I say our Father in heaven, I'm reminding myself that, that I have not only a Father, but I have a Father in heaven who is the ruler of the universe. He's sovereign. That means that he can do anything he wants to do. He is absolutely sovereign. He's in control. He sees it all. You don't hide anything from God. You might hide something from your parents. You might hide something from your spouse. You might hide something from whomever. God sees it all. He sees your life. And one day you're going to give an account of all of it. The Bible says every word we speak, well, one day there will be an account for that given. That's a scary thought. He sees it all. He knows it all. Some people go through life, you know, you watch some of those shows. I like to watch crime shows. I don't know why, but I just get caught up in the detective stuff, and I'm always impressed by these detectives who just are able to see things and figure things out. I've always been that way. 
And uh, in those crime shows, you know, if you stay with it, uh, where was I going with this point? <laughs> this is what happens when I get outside my notes. I was talking about the sovereignty of God, and how did I end up talking about crime shows? <laughs> God sees it all. He, he knows it all. I have no idea where I was going at that point, so let's just, if this was an email, I would have just deleted that. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'll remember it on the way home today. I'll probably tweet about it later or something. I have no idea. But we want to honor God's name. How would be your name? And so what we're doing when we're saying how would be your name is how would be your name is we're leaning into the holiness of God. We sang again about that this morning. We're leaning into his holiness. In other words, in our prayer of how would be their name, it, it, we're really just thinking about Think about if you're just praying, our Father in heaven, and just think about what that draws you to want to say to God. God, I'm so thankful that you're my Father. This is particularly helpful if you didn't have a good earthly father. All of us earthly fathers make mistakes. There are no perfect earthly fathers, and kids, you won't be a perfect parent either, so get over it. Most parents do the best they can. But even if you had a parent who didn't even try to do the best they could and they were, in fact, abusive or negligent or absent or whatever, very painful, but you should know that you have a heavenly Father who loves you, who's not like that, who promises to provide for you. You're not an orphan. And so we pray that and we lean into his holiness and we express that to God. And, and then hallowed be thy name. What we're expressing to God is just his very name is meaningful to us. So often in your Bible, if you're paying attention, you'll see the word Lord when it's referring to God. If you look in your Bible, a lot of times that will be capitalized every letter. L-O-R-D. And that's referring to a common name in scripture of God, which the English equivalent would be. It's translated in most translations, Lord. But it, it's really saying, the Lord God Almighty. That is the God we pray to. The Lord God Almighty. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Lord God Almighty is for you. And I just want to honor his name. And I do that by prayer. I do that by my thoughts. I, I do that by the way I, I live. And so we lean into his holiness. He is distinct. All these man-made gods that people in the world make up. All these religions that people make up. This is the one true God we're worshiping. And so we want to just honor his name. We want to know that he's going to lead us through all the things in life. We want to reverence his name. We want to honor his name. So there's about four truths I'd like you to write down. We'll try to work through these pretty quickly this morning. Four truths that are connected to his name. If you still have the little outline I gave you that has the Lord's Prayer on it in your Bible, there's some more out front, but we're going to be taking a look at that. You don't have to have it to process this, but there are four kind of foundational truths. So if we're going to honor his name, let me just give you four truths that are foundational to understanding this God that we want to honor, that we show reverence for. First of all, God's name reminds us that he will provide for our needs. God's name reminds us that he will provide for our needs. Philippians chapter 4, verses 19 and 20 says this, My God will supply all that you need from his glorious resources in Christ Jesus. And may glory be to our God and our Father forever and ever. Amen. In other words, God has made a promise by his very name. This first promise, if you have the outline, it says, under hallowed be thy name, I praise God that you are my provider. Where does that come from? There's a word in the Old Testament that's transliterated. In other words, the English translation of the Hebrew in the Old Testament is Jehovah Jireh. How many of you have heard that term before? Yeah. What does it mean? Jehovah Jireh, my what? Provider. God tells us by his very name, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to provide for you. Now, I made the mistake again this week. You know, one of my problems is I don't always live up to my preaching. Are you aware of that? That's the worst thing about being a preacher is the Holy Spirit comes and taps you on the shoulder. Helms, uh, remember that sermon? Oh, yeah, that was a good one, right? No, well, you got to live that too. You can't just preach it. 
And remember I told you we're in tough financial times. Are you aware of that? <laughs> and I told you, I gave you some great advice, and I didn't even charge you for it. I said, do not look at your 401k statements for about another year and a half. Don't do that. So guess what happens? I go to the mailbox yesterday. There it is. You know, Franklin Templeton Investments, my pastoral 401k, and I knew what it was in January. And it was $100,000 less yesterday. You're all in the same boat. And if you're not, please tell the rest of us so we can follow your great financial plan because we're all hurting from that. We're like, oh my gosh, why? Well, I know the answer, but my wife told me I've been too political lately, so I'm not going to go there. But anyway, I know the answer. You ask me after church when I'm not preaching. I know the answer. I'm not happy about it. By the way, we're going to have a prayer gathering on the last uh, Sunday of this month, which is our tradition, and we're going to be praying about the elections coming up. These elections are very important. Did you know that? We're going to be praying about it, and uh, we're not going to be doing a bunch of political speeches, but how many of you know we ought to pray about it? Would you agree with that? So we're going to gather, and uh, what can I do? So, so often we feel like there's stuff we can't do. Well, you can actually come to that prayer gathering and pray with us. So we're going to do that the last uh, Sunday night of the month, and uh, the elections are coming up in early November, and those kind of things matter. But you see, here's the thing. God's my provider, not my 401k, right? God's my provider, not the government. Aren't you glad? God is my provider, not even this church. God is my provider. He's the one who made the promise to me, Jehovah Jireh, I will provide. If you're running a business, you remember that. If you're in charge of a family budget, remember that. We're all in the same boat in one sense, and we all need to be remembered. We all need to remember this great name of God. How will be your name? That's why it's important to pray this prayer because it sort of settles down your thoughts. Because otherwise you're chasing like the rest of the crowd, the latest shiny object, the latest argument, the latest this, the latest that. And you're not settled in your spirit, at peace in your spirit. There's turmoil in your spirit. You're upset. You're angry all the time. Why? Because you're not resting in this promise of God who is your father who said, I will provide for you. I will. So I reminded God of that when I put my 401k, which I opened and wasn't supposed to, in my little drawer in my bedroom. I reminded God, God, you are my provider, right? Yeah, I'm, I haven't changed. Okay, good. I'm going to not worry about it anymore. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rest in that. That's how this prayer can shape your life. We need to live this out, beloved, right? If not, we should just all be hunting or out watching football or, or doing something because if this stuff isn't really true, it's not worthy of us even setting aside time to come together and think about it. But if it is true, which it is, we need to start living this out in our life. Just as there's something distinct about God, he's distinct from any other God that's ever been produced by man. He, he's alone. There's nobody in his camp. He is the one true God. And just as he is distinct, so our lives need to be distinct from the world. And the tragedy is that so often the life of the church is not very distinctive from the life of the community they live in. It's hard to tell the difference. Why? We're not living out the Lord's prayer. This is how we live. This is how we live. We're people who know God is my provider. Well, I should get to the second one. Number two, God's name reminds us that he is our righteousness. He is our righteousness. Let me just give you a homework assignment. Are you ready? Here's your homework assignment for the next seven days. Now, I started this series by challenging you to pray the Lord's Prayer for 21 straight days. I'm not going to embarrass you by asking how many of you already quit the challenge, but I've been doing it. So here's my challenge to you for the next seven days. I want you to think of something in your life right now that you're worried about. God's promise to you is he's Jehovah Jireh. He's going to provide for you. You can apply that in every area of your life, whether you're young or old. God's promise is, I'm going to provide for you. You're not an orphan. Stop living like it. I'm your father. So I want you to pray 
for seven days, every day this week, between now and next Sunday, this is your homework assignment. I want you to think of something in your prayer time. What is something I'm really concerned about and worried about in terms of provision that I need in my life? And I want you to acknowledge that to God in prayer. We don't have to be phony with God. He sees it and he knows it. God knows your heart. You can't fool him. He sees it. Just articulate it into a prayer. God, this is something I'm worried about. I know I shouldn't be worrying. I'm going to just trust you, God, that you're going to be who you say you are. You're Jehovah Jireh. You're going to provide. And every day this week, for seven days, I challenge you to do that, and you're going to be surprised at the release you have in your spirit when you do that. Because you can't worry and trust God at the same time. And if every day you're beginning your day and you're ending your day by taking on this homework assignment and praying that kind of a prayer to God, it's going to change how you think. It's going to change how you feel. You're going to be able to watch God do what he promised. This isn't on Helms. I didn't make the promise. Alvin Helms is not your provider. If I am, you're in big trouble. Right? But God is the one who actually made the promise. You know one of the great names of God in Scripture that you ought to remember? You remember when God says in the Old Testament and then Jesus in the New Testament amplifies this. That's why they got so mad at him. You remember how God identified himself when they were, you know, Moses was trying to figure out a name of, you know, what am I going to tell the people? God spoke to me, and yeah, they're going to really believe that, and who am I going to tell them spoke to me? And remember what God said to him? I am what? And you want to say, what? what? What does that mean? I am who I am. It sounds like something Popeye would have said, right, to us. I am who I am. What does that mean? You know what it means? Listen to me. Here's what it means. It's God's way of saying, Alvin, I know you're worried about your 401K. You're unhappy with the folks in D.C., okay? I know all of that because I know you. But remember my name. I am who I have always been. I am now who I have always been and who I will always be. What is God saying through that? He's consistent. He has a history. Read the book. Start in Genesis. He's a God who keeps making promises and his people keep doing what? Doubt. (laughs) Well, that might have been true for so-and-so or that was true for them, but... Uh, You know, God obviously hasn't seen my 401k. And we make fun of them, and then we do the same thing. Well, that's it. My business is over. That's it. This relationship is over. That's it. These kids are never going to come back to Jesus. God says, I am Jehovah Jireh. I am now who I have always been and who you can count on always to be. You put your trust in me. Amen? Amen. What a privilege we have. When your neighbors and your friends and your coworkers and your school uh, mates, whatever you call them, the other people that go to school with you, whatever setting you're in, when they begin to see you're living a different kind of life, they're going to notice this. Because your whole way of thinking, response, is going to be different. We live in a world where everyone is just mad at everybody else. Have you noticed that? Everybody's just angry. And when they see you're living a different kind of life because you're getting above it all and you're tuning into your Heavenly Father's love for you and promise to provide for you, it's going to resonate with them. They're going to say, I need that. Not only that, God says, secondly, that his name reminds us that he's our righteousness. Jeremiah chapter 23, 6, you might want to write this down and look it up later. Jeremiah the prophet said, and this will be his name The Lord is our righteousness. Another name of God. And that day Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. Jeremiah was writing that when everything around him was falling apart. They called him the weeping prophet because he had to watch his nation get farther and farther and farther away from God. 
And he saw the results that were going to come with that, the punishment that was going to come with that. And he was a man of God and a sensitive man. And he loved God and he knew his nation was getting away from God. And he became known as the weeping prophet. That was his ministry. But he speaks in faith and he says, Because the Lord is our righteousness, in that day Judah will be saved and Israel will one day live in safety. And that's exactly what happened. The Lord is our righteousness. Beloved, you know why you can rest on Sunday morning? You know why you don't have to be concerned with God? He loves me. He loves me not. You know, you take the old flower when you're trying to figure out if that girl really likes you. You know, she loves me. She loves me not. This is back before there were video games and we found ways to entertain ourselves. <laughs> I remember that girl in fifth grade that I thought was so beautiful, Karen, and I remember thinking, I wonder if she loves, she loves me, she loves me not. She lo and you get to the end and she loves me not and it's heartbreak, right? Because that must be true, you know, just like something you read on the internet now. That must be a, a true method. But you don't have to worry about that with God. He's your righteousness. Do you realize the privilege of what that is for your life as a believer, the security that gives you? Can I ask a personal question? Anybody here sin last week? Anybody? Yeah. We all miss the mark every week, don't we, in many ways. To know this is how you can rest. This is why worship is a time of rest. We don't have to work your emotions up. We don't have to do our calisthenics while we're worshiping. Now, some of you just enjoy doing that. That's fine. But we're not doing it from a place of trying to get God's attention or earn his favor. Right? You can just rest in his worship. Why? He's done the work. Your sins are forgiven. Your guilt and shame have been taken care of. You can rest in that. He's my righteousness. That means that if you were in a heavenly courtroom, can you imagine this? What if right now, suddenly you were transported from this service and you were face to face with God? Do you realize that's really going to happen for you one day? It really is going to happen. Why? That's what God said, and he's kind of always doing what he says he's going to do. Can you imagine if you were there and there was a court scene going on, and you realized my case is on the docket, Alvin Helms, and the prosecuting attorney is there, Satan, or one of his helpers. Probably Satan's not concerned about me, so whoever's 759th down the list. So they're there, you know. They're going to make the case against Alvin Helms. And they have all of my sins. I'm 61 years old. Uh, I've sinned a lot in 61 years. Do you believe that? Yeah? So have you. So he's got this case. And here's the problem, right? What's the problem with the case, from my point of view, that the prosecuting attorney has? What is the problem? Everything in there is true. He's got me and he knows it. Everything in this thick file of my sins is absolutely 100% the truth. Now, what is my hope of escaping the death penalty? Because that's what the death penalty is for rebelling against God. The, the penalty, judicially, for rebelling, for rebelling against God is the death penalty. How do you know that? The wages of sin is what? Death. Guess what? Wages means I earned it. That's what I've earned. So I'm not stupid, and the prosecuting attorney is there making his case. Boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, well, we're going to call, uh, we're gonna call the uh, whatever I'm called in the legal profession to the seat. <laughs> we're going to let the guy being accused, the accuser, right, or whatever that legal term is. Should have had more coffee this morning. So Helms, come on up. You're going to now defend this. What can I say? It's all true. What's my only hope? Someone comes into the courtroom, says, I'm going to speak to this now. Absolutely everything this prosecuting attorney has said about Helms is 100% true. But here's the difference. 2,000 years ago on a cross, I took his place, and I took every one of his sins, and I paid the penalty through my own perfect life of obedience. See, that's righteousness. I have real righteousness because what counts for me in my spiritual bank account now 
is not just Christ's death for me, but his life for me. He lived perfectly. Not one day did he sin. Not one time. Jesus did not, not one time ever take one step in the wrong direction. He had perfect righteousness. And the judge knows that. All they could do was lie about Jesus. Make stuff up. He never did one thing wrong. His entire earthly life, can you imagine that? And he looks at this prosecuting attorney and says, this has already been covered. My righteousness is now applied to his spiritual bank account. I took all that junk you have in the file, which is absolutely true, and I took it upon myself, and I bore the legal punishment for that sin. This man over here now stands as righteous before God and is forgiven. Next case. Can you imagine my feeling in that situation? Love, that's your state if you're a believer. Don't let the enemy beat you up. Christians will do a good enough job of that. Don't let the enemy beat you up. Because you know the story. Your shame and your guilt have been absolutely dealt with. And now you want to live a life of holiness. Now you live in holiness. Why do you want to be holy like your God is holy? It's out of deep gratitude. You can't earn anything. You can't earn this righteousness. You can't earn the favor of God. This righteousness is a gift that God has given to you in faith when you said, I choose to put my faith and trust in Jesus and his work for me. I receive his righteousness into my heart, and I now walk as a saved person. If you've never done that, today's a great day to do that. But you have to admit, admit just like I sat on this stool, and admitted that you are 100% guilty. You can't get to forgiveness and reconciliation if you don't acknowledge I've sinned and I'm guilty and I deserve death and I deserve eternal punishment. It's called pride. Your pride will keep you out of heaven. God says, hey, I'm your righteousness. The Hebrew transliteration is Jehovah Sidkenu. What a word. Jehovah Sid Canoe. Sometimes I pray that to God. God, thank you. You are Jehovah Sid Canoe. You are my righteousness. And when people come and point their finger at me, you can't lead for very long without making someone mad, without getting sideways with someone, without someone thinking you made a bad decision or someone's upset at you. It's just the life of a leader. I was thinking about that this morning. I was thinking the question they should have asked me in Bible college in my naivety thinking that all the church people were going to be nice to me, the question they should have asked me is, Alvin Helms, how much pain are you willing to bear for the sake of the gospel? Because it's going to cost you. How much pain of misunderstanding? How much pain of gossip? How much pain of slander? How much pain of lack of encouragement? Lack of help? How much pain are you willing to take on for the sake of the gospel? And you need to ask yourself that question, too, because it's true for you as well. How much pain are you willing to bear for the sake of honoring the name of God? Because when you choose to honor the name of God, and when you choose to lean into holiness, because he is holy. The Bible says, without holiness, no one shall see God. And you lean into holiness for the right motives and the right reasons out of a life that's been transformed and a heart full of gratitude and a desire to look more like Jesus. It will cost you something. How do I know that? Do you just make this stuff up? No, I'm a Bible guy. What did Jesus say to his disciples? Did he say, oh, guys, let me tell you, it's going to be so great when you follow me? What did he say? He said, they hated me, and they're going to hate you too. Well, what? I don't like that. Well, I didn't say it. Jesus said it. The world will love you as long as you bow your knee to what they think ought to be the thought of the day. As long as you bow your knee to the world and their way of thinking and what they think is good and right and true, they will love you. The moment you stand up and say, it's not my truth or your truth that matters. There's only one truth and it's his truth. And that's what I'm going to follow is the moment the world will hate you. And if you're walking around trying to win the favor of the world, you're living a foolish life. It's not going to happen. 
It's not going to happen according to Jesus. But it's so good. It's so good to come to church, to realize that God is my righteousness, to realize the truth of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where Paul writes, God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. How about that? Beloved, you are righteous. If you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus, you can rest. When the enemy comes to haunt you, you can say, you better go chase someone else because my righteousness is secure in Christ. I have perfect righteousness, perfect standing before God because I'm in Christ. And when the Father looks at Christ and his work, he is pleased. And you are now in him. Here's a simple way to think about it. Your sins are either on you or they're on Jesus. There's no other choice. It's not a midpoint. It's not a, well, I've got purgatory to count on or, you know, my cousin was a pastor, so I'm sure that's going to get me some good point. No, your sins right now, right where you sit. I said, man, I should have stayed home and watched football. Probably you're right because you're going to hear the truth and you're now accountable and responsible. Your sins right now are either on you or they're on Christ. No other choice. And if your sins are on you, when you're sitting in that chair on that final day of accounting, and the case is made against you and how you've lived your life, there is no defense other than the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There's no defense of, well, I went to church. Well, I was baptized. Well, I was a member of a church. I gave a lot of money to that church. No. Your sins are on you or they're on Jesus. And we can rest, beloved, today. We can enjoy the name of God. If you have your little outline, the prayer guide, under hallowed be your name, we can rejoice and say, God, I praise you today that you're my righteousness. You could spend five minutes just praying out that sentence from your heart, thanking God for what it means, for your understanding of that. And then number three, Third foundational truth for honoring God's name is this. God's name reminds us that he wants us to experience real peace. Most of you know that term. It's Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Shalom. God wants you to be at peace. He's a God of reconciliation. He wants you to be at peace with himself. He wants you to be at peace with other people. He wants you to be at peace inside yourself. What a blessing as a Christian that we know that God is our real peace. Some days I just camp out on on this part of the prayer and I just think about what it means that that God is my peace. It doesn't matter I live in a world that's constantly at war and I live in a world where people are just so mad at each other and I live in a world where there's so much lawlessness and anger and so many things that concern me because God says, Helms, it's right in the midst of this that I'm going to give you real peace. How do you know that? Because Jesus said it. What did he say? He says, I'm going to give you a kind of peace that the world doesn't even understand. The Bible uses the phrase, a kind of peace that passes all understanding. The world can't even, they don't get it. Why aren't you angry like us? Why don't you pick a team like we do and hate one half of the population? How can you be at peace? Because God says, I want to be your peace. So many people walk around and they're always at war with everything. They're in arguments at work. They're in arguments in the church. They're in arguments in their neighborhood. It's almost like they enjoy a good fight. Truth is, that's the way some people act. Can I just give you a helpful pastoral hint? If you got conflict in most areas of your life, the problem isn't the other people, it's you. Hello? Look in the mirror. It's not an accident. If you don't get along with people at work, you don't get along in your marriage, you don't get along with your kids, you don't get along in the church, you don't get along in your neighborhood, you're always, your name's always coming up. I don't get too worried in the life of the church when a person's name comes up, just here and there, once in a while, that's life, community, all that. But when the same person's name keeps coming up again and again and again and again, there's an issue. God wants to give us peace. He wants us to have peace in this church body. 
He doesn't want us to be in conflict with each other, arguing with each other, selfishness, selfish behavior, my way or the highway. No. He wants us to experience peace. We're a family, the joy of peace with one another. Jesus said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And then number four, we'll finish with this one. Thinking about God's name, how can we honor God's name? We're so glad that he's my provider. Just say that in your heart right now. God, I'm so glad you're my provider. I praise you. God, I'm, I'm so glad that you are my peace. God, I'm so glad that you're my righteousness. I sat here on the stage most days. That's my prayer. Some days there's a lot of not, not a lot of emotion with it. Some days there's tears in my eyes. I don't try to hype it or make it happen. But I don't get over it. God, you are my peace. You're my provider. You're my righteousness. And then what's the last one? You've got it right there on your outline. You are my healer. You are my healer. The, the Hebrew transliteration is, is a phrase called Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Rapha. What that means is that God promises to be your healer. Now, I don't understand everything about this. They're, they're, we live in a broken world. We, we live in a world where people have struggles in their body. People have struggles in their emotions. But I will say this, God's promise is that he would be our healer. And I don't know how it always works out, and I certainly don't have it figured out. But I do know I've seen God's hand in my own life where God has healed me many different times. Sometimes physically, sometimes emotionally, spiritually, relationally. I've experienced the healing touch of God. Not unlike you, there have been days when I've been in the office, at home, tears coming down my eyes because of some issue of hurt, deep hurt, wondering where God is, only to see God respond with his healing touch. I have known God as my healer. That's God's promise to you. Jehovah Rapha, I am your healer. Don't be afraid to pray for and ask God for healing. We don't demand how he does it and <clears throat> when he does it, if he does it, but we pray for it. God, I pray for your healing. Don't give up on a relationship. God, we need healing in this family. We need healing in this work situation. We need healing in our church family. God is your healer. In conclusion this morning, what, what have we said? I want you to leave here with full hearts this morning. I, I want you to leave here thinking, hey, I don't have to worry. God is my source. He's my provider. I don't have to worry. Think about that this week as you pray the Lord's Prayer. Think about this promise of God. I, I want you to leave here thinking, I don't have to be guilty. I, I don't have to walk around feeling guilty. I have been forgiven by God. Whatever I've done, I've been forgiven. I know God is my righteousness. I want you to leave here this morning thinking, hey, I don't have to be afraid anymore. The world's in bad shape. We could talk about that for another hour. The world's in bad shape, but I don't have to be in fear. I, I don't have to walk around afraid because he is my shalom. I, I have peace in my soul. God's in control. I have peace. I want you to leave here this morning thinking, I don't have to hurt anymore. God is my healer. I don't have to carry this around anymore. I can let go of this. I can turn it over to God. I, I, I can pray for his healing. And if he doesn't heal me the way that I hope he does or in the time frame that I hope he will, I know that he will sustain me to stand up under it and I will experience his healing in a different way. He is my healer. Psalm 33 verses 20 to 22 say this. We wait for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, and him our hearts find joy. In his holy name we trust. Let your mercy rest on us, O Lord, since we wait with hope for you. So how do we honor his name? We can honor his name by the way we worship. 
is he really your greatest treasure? Have you found in him your, your greatest pleasure? Your greatest satisfaction is found in him. God is glorified in us to the degree that we are most satisfied in him. We honor his name by the way we worship. We honor his name by the way we live. We live a life of faith and repentance and trust in him. That's our life. Our life is faith, repentance. Faith, repentance. Trust in him. How do we leave here today? We, we, we live our life and honor his name by the way we love. What kind of love do you show God? What kind of love do you show one another? What kind of love do you show those who are outside the, the family? Are you aware of the deep love he has for you? How deep the Father's love for us? By the way, we serve him everywhere he places us. We can honor his name. Would you bow your heads for a moment? You just take a moment right where you are. Just talk to God. I just encourage you to right where you're seated just to honor him. Tell him how much you praise him for these things we've talked about this morning. Just praise him that he's your provider. Praise him that he's your righteousness. Praise him that he's your peace. Praise him that he's your healer. Don't miss the moment. Just take a moment. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Lord, how we do just that today. God, it's hard for us to believe that just a few words in a prayer can unlock so much in our hearts and our minds as we think about it, reflect on it, talk about it. May God the Holy Spirit take these words this morning that we've shared, these thoughts from Scripture, plant it deep in our heart and our life. Lord, we want to live the Lord's Prayer. We don't want to just be people who say the Lord's Prayer, but we want to be people who live a Lord's Prayer kind of life for your glory for our own good, for the good of the city and the good of your kingdom. May it ring true, I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Would you stand this morning? Hear these words of benediction as we leave today. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless and keep you, beloved. We'll see you next time.